From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Jimmy Sayer at Internet Allied Life, Johnny. Oh, hi, Jim. How are you? The way I feel now, the way I'm going to feel depends on you. Okay, let's have it. Remember a guy named King Tut? Egyptian mummy they dug out of a tomb full of treasure a few years ago. That's right. Well, don't tell me you held a policy on him now, Jim. (laughs) Seriously, now. You'll also remember there was supposed to be a curse on anybody who molested his tomb. Yeah, supposed to be. But, of course, anybody knows that stuff's a lot of malarkey. Is it? Isn't it? Better reserve judgment, Johnny, until you hear about the curse of Kamashek. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Interallied Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account item one, one dollar even. Taxi to the office of Interallied Life to talk with Jim Sayer. The conference was brief and not very enlightening. I'd much rather have you see Mr. Turnbull and get the story from him yourself. As I said in the beginning, he's a very important client. What's more to the point, he can tell you about it much better than I can. Jim, to coin a cliche, you're being just as clear as mud. Also, by the way, he specifically asked for you. Oh, how come? Well, it seems he liked the way you handled the Parkinson case a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, Emily Parkinson, the widow who died. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. She was his sister. And, well, go down and see him, Johnny. I, I honestly can't tell you anything more than I already have about the thing. James, you have told me nothing. But he can, and you can pick up a nice fee on it. As a favor to me? No. Nope. For that nice fee. Jim promised to phone Eric Turnbull that I was on my way, and I ran of items two and three, four dollars and twenty cents, for a quick lunch and train fare to Stamford. There I was met by a chauffeured car and driven to Turnbull's house. Far out of the town on Birchbrook Road, it was set on one of the biggest, most beautifully landscaped pieces of property I'd ever seen. The fine old home looked as though it had stood there in all its straight-laced dignity for a hundred years, and stolid against the changing world would stand for another hundred. In sharp contrast, a lithe, clean Studebaker Golden Hawk was parked in the sweeping driveway at the front. Haskins, the chauffeur, had explained on the way that he doubled his butler, so I wasn't particularly surprised when he opened the door for me. Since you received the call about your coming, sir, you are to go right in while I take the motor car to the garage. Unless... He glanced at the Golden Hawk quickly back of me, then, having left the word unless hanging in midair, climbed back behind the wheel and drove off. Well, he said go right in. Inside, the house was a classic. From the tile-floored reception room with its walls of oak and the broad staircase leading to the second floor, I could look into the huge living room, finished in polished mahogany with a leaded glass window at one side and thick oriental rugs on the floor. A fireplace that seemed to take in a whole wall and fine mahogany furniture that glowed with a beautiful patina. Beyond that, I could see the library, golden and walnuts. And sitting at a broad desk was a man, his face red with anger, shaking his fist at a very attractive girl of 22 or 3 who stood before him, obviously distressed by what was going on. Don't call me Uncle Eric. I'm not your uncle now, and by heaven, if I have my way, I never will be. (coughs) You're not married to him yet, my girl, and if I have anything to say about it, you... Oh. Oh. Mr. Dollar, isn't it? Yes, sir. Mr. Turnbull? That's right. Come in, come in. And Dorothy, Mr. Dollar, and I wish to be alone. The girl stood there for a brief moment, looking at the man with an expression of utter futility in her face. Then, without so much as a glance at me, he turned and left by the door that I had just entered. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Come in, please. Thank you. I'm sorry about this. Somewhat embarrassing to you, I'm sure. But it's, well, it's something I'll have to tell you about later. Sit down, please. Thanks. May I pour you a drink? I must confess, I feel I could use one at the moment. No, no thanks, Mr. Turnbull. I uh, think I'll pass it. I suppose it is a little early, but, well, good luck. Now, 
Jim Sayer, an inner ally, tells me you have an insurance problem. Actually, not yet. I'll be perfectly frank with you, Mr. Dollar. Please do. I'm asking you to help me not as an insurance investigator, but as a man I feel I can trust. <laughs> but you don't really know me, Mr. Turnbull. Oh, on the contrary, I do very well. As a result of your handling of the case of my widowed sister, Emily, when she died a few years ago. As a matter of fact, you and I met very briefly at the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, Emily Parkinson. The case involved a lot of phony relatives who filed claims on her estate. Yes, that's right. And your clever trapping of those false claimants and their cheap attempts to gain part of Emily's fortune was... I understand that several of them are still serving sentences. Yeah, I believe so. Which is quite what they deserve. If there's anything I detest in this world, it's dishonesty. Well, I, uh, I guess most of us feel that way about it. Of course we do, if we have any shred of human dignity. Yeah. But now, uh, what is your problem? It uh, concerns Donald, uh, Emily's son, my nephew. I had expected him to arrive here before you, but suppose I go ahead anyway. Go ahead. Well, when her husband died, Emily was left with a considerable estate and their only child, Donald. The uh, estate's worth nearly a million now. Mm -hmm. With not too many years ahead of us, she wasn't well. She had lavished everything on the boy, the best of private schools, travel to Europe, all the things that befit one of our social and financial status. Before she died, she carefully put all of the money into a trust for Donald, a rather unique arrangement which I control until he reaches the age of 30. What would happen if he didn't survive you? Would it all pass to you? Uh, uh, yes, yes. But of course, I have no particular need of it. When I sold Turnbull Enterprises some years ago, I, I think you can see that I'm pretty well fixed investments, you know. Yeah. At uh, any rate, since his mother died, Donald has been living here with me in accordance with her request that I care for him. And I've been glad to do it, for I love the boy very dearly. How old is he, by the way? Uh, 25. He'll be 26 in October. And what's he doing for a living? Uh, that's the whole point. There's no need for him to work for a living, as you put it. But in college, against my better judgment, he majored in archaeology and Egyptology. Hmm. What did you want him to study? <laughs> Business and finance, of course. Forgive me for being so blunt, Dollar, but I see no sense whatsoever in his taking the fortune that his father spent so many years building up and squandering it on a lot of... of... Oh, oh, Donald, come in, come in. I received word at the club you wished to see me, Uncle Larry. What is it this... Oh. Mr. Dollar, this is my nephew, Donald Cronin. How do you do, Mr. Hi, Dollar? Donald. We've been talking about you, Donald. Oh? As a result of a newspaper item I just read, to the effect that you're preparing for another expedition. That's right, sir. I'm going to the ancient city of Thebes in Egypt. Egypt? Since my trip last fall, I've done a lot of reading and research in New York and London. I'm convinced I've located the ancient tomb of the pharaoh Kamashek. An advance party's already begun excavation. I'll join them there. Do you realize the cost of this, this thing? Uncle Eric, it promises to be one of the most important archaeological finds of the century. You mean it might be if I let you go? If you let me go? Uncle Eric, perhaps Mr. Dollar... Mr. Dollar can hear anything I have to say to you. You see, Dollar, we're finally getting to the point. Uh, yeah... Donald, I'll make no bones about it. I'm quite fed up with your wasting your time on these stupid, pointless expeditions. That's not the way the museum feels about them, sir. Well, that's the way I feel about oh, them. Wait, sir, please. Uh, Donald, isn't that your collection for Yucatan that the museum recently acquired? Why, yes, sir. My party and I were able to... I'm sure we don't care about your party and you. You're not only wasting your time, but your money. The money your father struggled an entire lifetime to gain. That money was left for me to spend in any way I see fit. Provided your handling of it meets my approval. When you're 30 and the estate passes completely into your hands, you can do anything you like with it. Buy the Brooklyn Bridge if you want. You probably will. But until then, I am legally in control of it. And now, finally, I have every intention of exercising that control. At least to the extent of seeing you don't squander any more of it on these foolhardy expeditions. I take it you've made several, Donald. Yes, sir, and he's opposed me in all of them. Because sooner or later, you've got to learn that as the wealthy son of a family, it's up to you to carry on the tradition that's been set for you. To increase the fortune that's part of your family name. Build even greater financial power. Not to throw it away. Do you call my contributions to science and history a waste of money? Oh, now look, my boy. There's nothing selfish about my attitude in this matter. I'm thinking only of you and your future. The family name that you alone are left to uphold. Well... Now, why don't you give up this asinine idea of going to Egypt? No, sir. What do you mean, no? Let me finish. There's no point in your saying any more, Uncle. I'm going to explore the tomb of Kamashek. Now, listen here, you I've young made Drake. all the arrangements, obtained the sponsorship of the museum, notified the universities that are interested in my work. I say you're not going. And I say I am, sir. You young fool. Don't you realize that I'm in a position to cut you off without a penny? 
If you think I care, Uncle Eric, you're crazy. Then by heaven, I will. So help me, Donald. I've tried to avoid this kind of situation, but you and your idiotic bullheadedness, your utter disregard for the responsibility and importance of your family, social status have made it inevitable. Now it's come in spite of all I've tried to do, and by heaven, I'll cut you off without a... Wait a minute. Donald, where are you going? Egypt. In the moment or two before Eric Turnbull recovered his poise enough to speak to me, my mind raced. This whole situation offered a big flock of wild possibilities. Obviously, the two were at sword points, had been for some time. Apparently, and I began to wonder about this, Turnbull had no need of Donald's money. Yet he seemed determined to keep him from spending it. And on what looked to me like a very worthy expedition. If Donald died, Turnbull had said, the estate would pass to him. Oh, and something else I wanted to find out about. The girl who had been there when I arrived. But why? Why? Why did I want to know or need any answers? What could this whole affair possibly have meant to me? I'm no family counselor. I'm an... In... I guess I spoke that thought out loud. I'm an insurance investigator. Yes, Dollar. Which is another reason why I need your help in this affair. But I, uh, I just don't see it, Mr. I'm Turnbull. I'm afraid I must apologize for that little scene a moment ago. Well, there's no need to. It was interesting, to say the least. Well, we didn't touch on the one thing that I wanted you to know about. That girl, Dorothy Harkness, is so-called fiancé. <laughs> oh. Thanks to a generous allowance, plus fees from the museum and some of the universities, Donald's insured his life for $100,000. $50,000 for the museum, and a like amount for the girl. Through Inter-Allied? Yes. I'll put it to you bluntly. She has prodded him to go on these expeditions. And I believe she somehow hopes to engineer his death during this Kamashek project in order to collect on that policy. Do I make myself clear? If anything was clear about this situation, I certainly couldn't see it. More things had come flying at me from out of left field during the past half hour than I could cope with. And I wanted time to organize some kind of thinking. So I used a corny old device, glanced at my watch, said something about being late for an appointment back in Hartford. I apologize, promised to talk with him again tomorrow when there'd be more time. Haskins drove me back to the station and courteously waited until the train pulled in, then left. And it was then I noticed the little Studebaker Golden Hawk that I'd seen at the house pull up beside the platform, and the girl, Dorothy Harkness, jumped out and ran over to me. Mr. Dollar, I had to wait for Haskins to leave so he wouldn't see me. Oh? I must talk to you. Please call me. Here's the number. Is this about Donald? Yes. Because of the danger he's in. From Mr. Turnbull? No. And you must believe me. From the curse of Kamashek. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a little order starts to come out of the Department of Utter Confusion. And a promise of murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>